We have um, 10, 15 minutes for discussions, and we have mics wandering around the room. So if you raise your hand, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, I'm Zuzia Kote, and um, I'm from another centrally isolated land-grant university, Cornell. Um, one of the hats I wear in my library is uh, Director of Communication. And um, so I was really relating what you were saying about that and how, from your perspective, faculty like to grumble, but then they're also out there representing the university, so they have to have the overview as well. Same thing um, in the library, kind of as a mi microcosm. So I, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is how to, quote unquote, use librarians as a communication channel towards faculty and how do you get beyond that grumble phase and, and make sure that everybody has the big picture and people are armed with data, they're armed with um, different ways of, of representing what the 21st century research library does. Obviously you can do that by giving people talking points. They don't seem to like that. So I just wonder whether you have any pointers in that area. He's working on it. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I used to teach freshman physics. I'm not, I'm not sure I need the mic. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it really is uh, an organic thing to, to prepare communications, prepare faculty uh, and, and other stakeholders to speak for the campus. Uh, they, they have to feel good about what's happening on campus and they have to be informed. And most faculty, when they see an email from an administrator, they just hit the delete button. <coughs> Uh, so it, it's repetition of the communication in many different venues, uh, trying to make sure that they feel good that the administrators are looking out for them and that things, the, the university is being managed sensibly. Uh, and that, that's incredibly important, especially for us with the, the uh, shared governance structure that we have. Uh, we have to do that anyway. Uh, otherwise, we get into trouble with uh, our stakeholders who are the, the, the faculty and staff on campus. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's not any one thing. Like, like you say, it's, it, if you give bullet points, that, that certainly isn't going to work. Uh, but uh, trying to communicate through every venue and, and really staying on message, telling people over and over again the various things that are going on and, and getting input so that it's clear that they share in the ownership. Maybe I could just add a couple of thoughts to that. Um, I think librarians have a really important role on campus as they often are the, the people who straddle the territory between administration and faculty. They, they, are, they are both, in a sense. And often it can be fairly straightforward to cascade talking points from the university administration to librarians because they have that quasi-administration hat, but then in turn the librarians wearing their quasi-faculty hat can engage the research community in the good news about what's happening on campus. So I, I do think librarians have a, a critical role. One of the challenges I've seen in, in some settings is how to get librarians through the lab doors. We know that STEM researchers don't come into the library terribly often these days, if at all. Uh, so we need to work out how to get through the doors, and that sometimes can be challenging, but again, we can overcome that. Um, I'm from the University of California, Davis, and I have kind of an odd question for you. I don't want to ask about the funding model for these kinds of partnerships, because it's very different at every institution, but my university just happens to be going through the renegotiation for our federal overhead rate this year. And the way libraries are typically reviewed in that is the very traditional, you know, how many people walk in the door, how many checkouts were there. But you're talking about really the future of the library's role in supporting the research enterprise. So how do we evaluate its impact at the institution so that we can change the way we do these assessments and really think about how this um, should be financed potentially through, through that overhead rate? Any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so you, you, 
so first thought, uh, you, you have Harris Lou in there, who, who is a, a, a very creative guy, so I, I would definitely ask him that question. Uh, he came from Illinois. Uh, 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 but uh, the, uh, the, so there the are really two parts to it. I mean, one is whether it, how it gets accounted for uh, in the rate calculation, which is that that's a negotiation that's done by accountants, and uh, really it's the money spent. And the, the, the main thing, it, F and A that gets charged to the government is really reimbursement for money the university has already spent to support research. And uh, you just have to be sure to document uh, the amount of money that's being spent on all of these services to the accountants to make sure they include it in the calculation. Uh, the, I, I, I could talk for 20 minutes on, on the details of that, but uh, I, I'd be glad to chat with you separately. But, but the, the, the second half, I think, which is, which is more interesting and, and over which you have more control, is, is how do you make sure that these things are appreciated by the people who are making the tough funding decisions? There, there isn't a lot of money at any institution, and uh, you know something like the communication through the researcher profile could be uh, cut easily, right, in, in a tough budget time. And I, actually, I worry about that right now for us. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be, but, but we have to defend it. Uh, I, I think the way to make sure is to uh, communicate, to, to tell everybody about what's going on, and then to have good examples of grants that were facilitated because people found each other. Uh, examples of stakeholders who found experts because they looked on that uh, site, and to collect those anecdotes. Because what, what I find is that the, the anecdotes do a lot more than the statistics. Uh, and you know, if you can justify your existence on the base of, basis of one $20 million grant, uh, that will do much, much more in a budget discussion than statistics on your number of users per week. I think that for too long, librarians have been obsessed about counting things that move and counting things that don't move in case they do happen to move. And whilst that, that worked quite well in a traditional library setting where we really were curating things that sometimes moved, today we need to be focusing on the impact that our work has on institutional goals and priorities, whether it's recruiting students, whether it's securing the best research grants or demonstrating the best research impact and aligning how we talk about ourselves on campus with those goals using the anecdotes that, that you suggest is tremendously important because going into um, an institutional setting and saying well last year our book circulation went up or down or whatever completely misses the point of what the university is interested in and if you think about the, the utility of adding or subtracting from library budgets, if people think you are really obsessed about books moving, the budget is going to go one way and it's not the way you want it to go. So I really do think we need to frame our demonstration of what we are about in that context of institutional priority and move things onto a, a different playing field. Uh, Constance Malthus, OCLC Research. Um, this is a really interesting pairing of, of presentations, and I'm quite interested in the, in the positioning of uh, research support services uh, as a shared service within the university. Um, and I'm thinking particularly it's interesting to have the pair of you there as, as representatives of AAU institutions, one of which is embedded in a larger public system, one of which is not. We know uh, that within the context of the AAU, there's a lot of uh, uh, concern and attention to the degrees to which being embedded in a public, life, a public university system can, can represent some constraints on innovation at a flagship campus. So specifically with regard to thinking about a positioning of services for, uh, for research management and reputation management. I wonder uh, if you have particular perspectives on whether or not uh, that systemness imposes any constraints on you. So, so you talked about uh, the, the Illinois, I'm not going to get the name right, the Illinois Research Connections, right? This is for UIUC. It's presumably not about the broader uh, research capacity and expertise of, say, 
uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. And I just wonder how you how you are managing that. Presumably for for Keith, in the context of Carnegie Mellon, uh, you have the kind of institutional autonomy to think about the upper level of that shared service. I know there are other extenuating circumstances <laughs> here. Uh, positioning that as a shared service within CMU for uh, for UIUC, is there any pressure to think about positioning that that as a shared service above your UIUC institution? Um, Let uh, me restate the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, you, you know, it, it, it's a it's a really important question because uh, campuses, uh, state state university campuses uh, that are parts of systems uh, have varying degrees of autonomy. Uh, and uh, I think that the, in the way University of Illinois has approached the, the issue uh, has been to give each campus quite a bit of autonomy. Uh, there, there, there hasn't been a, a heavy hand telling us that, that we have to uh, do particular things like shared services and supportive research uh, together with other campuses uh, within our system. And, and our system really only has three uh, comprehensive campuses, uh, Chicago, Springfield, and Urbana-Champaign. Uh, that being said, we, we do collaborate uh, with our colleagues on the other campuses quite a bit, and uh, there, there are some examples I can go into where, you know, we, we've, we have worked closely, uh, especially with Chicago, uh, on uh, supporting researchers together. Maybe just a quick explanation for my colleagues from other countries that the, the AAU is the 50 or 60 or thereabouts most research intensive universities in the US, a bit like the Russell Group in the UK or the Group of Eight in Australia. Uh, what I had thought um, coming into a, a private university was that there'd be um, boundless wealth, but it doesn't quite work like that. And, um, we are incredibly reliant on federal research funding and are therefore bound by and constrained by the funding opportunities and the regulations imposed by the, the federal agencies. And we're in the midst of an NSF audit at the moment, which brings its own delight and joy. Uh, when I think back to, say, my time in Australia in a system that was almost entirely publicly funded, we did find that government there was much more able and willing to invest in the research infrastructure. So through the um, research assessment scheme that I mentioned, universities were funded very generously to build a network of repositories and data archives to support the administration of that activity. We certainly don't see that in private universities in the AAU, but I don't suspect we see it in public universities in the AAU. There's just a, a very different funding regime. So I'm not, whilst we very much are in different trajectories, we are not you know, caught up in some of the state politics and the discourse in some states about whether universities are good things or quasi-crypto-communist apparatus. Um, we still have our constraints. Please. Hi. Uh, I'm Jiro Kokuryo from Keio University. And uh, I strongly share uh, what Peter explicitly said, and the keys to some, to, to some extent, the, the feeling or the wish, the desire to, to have, uh, to collaborate with the librarians between, the, to promote uh, collaboration between the research uh, group and, and librarians. At the same time, uh, my, my personal experience uh, within my own university, trying to have um, uh, the, you know, the, like the research node database, uh, the, 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 the entire database uh, around research and, and the library uh, infrastructure. Plus, uh, uh, we are at, uh, in, in the process of reorganizing our web page, <coughs> the public relations. But trying to, trying to synchronize the efforts uh, among them has been, excuse me, terrible. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and partly because uh, we, I don't think we have a, a design philosophy for how we may create the architecture, uh, how, how the division of uh, work uh, should, 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 should be uh, organized. And, or is that simply my uh, ignorance or is there some solution already? 
on this topic? So when I think about the um, setup at Carnegie Mellon, I was fortunate to arrive on the same day as our new president, who had previously been director of the National Science Foundation. And we now have, he appointed a, a VP for research, who is now the provost, who was previously head of one of the directorates at the NSF. So they get it, and it <laughs> makes it tremendously easy to knock on the door and say, think about when you were at the NSF, and think about your role now in managing an institution. You need to get this right. They get it. So we're tremendously fortunate, and we don't have these questions about, you know, they, they know that the library brings the information expertise and the architectural understanding into that landscape. And we too are in conversation with Elsevier about some of the, the tools that we've heard about at Urbana Champagne. So I think it's about, if you're lucky, you've got the, the supporters and champions on campus already. If not, it's about pitching your offer at the highest level, whether it's at a Council of Deans meeting or at a, a university leadership council meeting, you need to demonstrate that you've got the goods and that you can make a difference. And then they won't be able to, you, know, you won't be able to get out of it. They will constantly be coming along asking you to innovate, which is a very good place to be. Yeah, I, I, actually, I, I would concur with that exactly. I, I, I'm also fortunate. I, I've, our provost and uh, chancellor are both National Academy members. They, they, they understand research. They understand what the library brings to it, and that, that makes all the difference in the world. I, I know not every institution uh, has that same level of research understanding uh, at, at the, in the top ranks. Uh, but you know, to, to demonstrate success uh, is really the first uh, step forward. And I, I, I think if, you know, if, if it's not already obvious to the people in the, in the leadership positions, then uh, to demonstrate success to them, they, they will realize what a good thing libraries have. Just a quick anecdote on that. In working with my fellow deans, we were looking at some of the, the university rankings that came out, and they were trying to understand why we were positioned in particular disciplines in particular order against institutions that we thought we were better than or not as good as. And we had taken a subscription to SciVal, and very quickly we were able to generate tabular data that demonstrated how the results were arrived at, and that just um, changed the dialogue very quickly. And we were seen as the credible research champions on campus, not the place full of books. Do we have one last question? Jackie Dooley, OCLC Research. Um, over the years, I've seen situations, not uncommonly, where librarians have a hard time getting in the door of faculty if they can't demonstrate some reasonable level of disciplinary knowledge. Do you see that in any way as an issue in today's context? It's a tough one, and one that I really do wrestle with. You know, I have seen librarians who don't have a strong disciplinary background in the field in which they are working do a tremendous job. They understand the landscape of scholarly communication in the field with which they liaise and are tremendous. I've seen others struggle. Similarly, I've seen People, you know, we, we bring in people with postdocs or as postdoc fellows working in data curation type settings, and some of them take their disciplinary background and apply it to great effect to communicate the importance not only of data curation but proper information management. And I've seen others not do terribly well. I think it comes down to the chemistry and the, the drive and enthusiasm of the individual. So I wouldn't be prescriptive and say one is right, one is wrong. It's about getting the best people. And rather, as, as you said, about bringing in the best researchers to your institution, so too bringing in the best information specialists by creating a culture and an environment of which they wish to be part really is the aim to which I would subscribe. Yeah, and uh, the, the only thing I, I would add to that 
is that as the library changes its role, as, as the role evolves, it will become, I, I think, more and more relevant to a wider swath uh, of faculty on campus as, as they're preparing their data management plans, as they're seeing how their information gets communicated outward uh, through things like the Elsevier Pure uh, or uh, uh, other equivalent systems that are run by libraries. And so I, I, I suspect that uh, some of the, those biases might, uh, uh, might fade with time. But you have to have great people. Will you join with me in thanking Keith and Peter? Thank you.